Hello, I'm Yvette Torres, and welcome to another edition of The Road to Recovery. Today we'll be talking about criminal justice reform, implications for services for mental and substance use disorders. Joining us in our panel today are Dr. Kimberly Johnson, Director, Center for Substance Abuse Treatment at the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Rockville, Maryland. Timothy Wynn, Veteran Certified Peer Specialist in the City of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. George Williams, Vice President of Community and Government Affairs for Treatment Alternatives for Safe Communities, TASC, Chicago, Illinois. Roberta Myers, Director of the Legal Action Center's National Hire, helping individuals with criminal records re-enter through employment network, Atlanta, Georgia. So George, as communities prepare to re-enter um, individuals from the criminal justice system, uh, can you explain to us what are the likely critical physical health and behavioral health needs that they will have upon re-entry into the community? Well, that's a very good question. Well, you, you know, I think that one of the critical needs is housing, that if an individual returning to the community don't have stable housing, then that creates an uh, imbalance in them being able to make a decision and make steps towards taking their rightful places back in their respective communities. I think also that the community have to, that one have to understand that, that communities sometimes have to find ways to, to embrace the individual and they will need to understand that there's certain things that he or she have to do to navigate and to make the right decisions. Cause, because they're coming back different from how they left. They have to come back with a new attitude, a, a new belief, and the community have to find a way to Em, to embrace that new desire to make changes in their lives. But housing, I think, is, is fundamental to having a successful experience. Thank you, George. And um, Kim, as we're looking at criminal justice reform, um, are we setting up a, a, an approach that act, actually addresses those needs of the individuals that are returning? I think when we look at the um, people that are returning um, from jails or prisons, those are some of the things that we're looking at that we really need to consider a whole comprehensive array of services for people that are coming out um, and starting a new life. So housing is certainly one of the biggest issues that we know, um, health care, access to substance use disorder treatment. And that is one, one of the things I think I want to um, point out is people are at very high risk at the point where they re-enter the community. Their tolerance for their um, drugs of choice is lower. We know that, um, that it's a time of risk for overdose. Um, so we need to get them linked up very quickly to services and whichever services yeah. that they need. Yeah. And Roberta, we are doing that through the drug court programs. How is that happening in, in real life? In multiple ways. Um, through National Higher Network and Legal Action Center, we're seeing um, that many, many agencies have to be involved and engaged in that community transition process because people need to be connected to the services that both Kim and George talked about. Um, if they went in with addiction issues, they need to be connected to care and treatment in the community. Um, many folks don't have um, stable housing set up and that could jeopardize, jeopardize their reentry. But one thing, for those that are going through specialized court systems, often what they find, these systems have been set up to deal with the multiple needs that that individual and challenges that that individual may face that, and, and that specifically is connected to their criminal behavior. And I think that's what's been really important with creating these specialized courts that can deal with people with different backgrounds, different challenges and the like. And I think we need to create 
community supports that reflect those differences. And, and I always say that this population isn't a monolithic group. You know, we have different individuals, different experiences. Not everyone has a substance use disorder. Not everyone has a chronic um, um, challenge in terms of a mental health disorder. So we have to kind of meet people where they are, do better with assessing what their needs are, and then connecting them to appropriate services that can help them move along and become stable. That's a very good point. And Timothy, what are we looking at in terms of vets that are coming through the system and um, are there special needs that one needs to be aware of? Absolutely. I think the, um, the main thing is trauma. Um, we see uh, most veterans have experienced some sort of trauma either in combat or prior to uh, combat. And um, one of the things that, that is so important to treating veterans is addressing that trauma. Until that trauma is addressed, they really can't move forward. They can't start to work on the substance abuse and things of that nature. A lot of veterans use drugs and alcohol to cope with the effects of the trauma, so that needs to be addressed uh, almost immediately. Almost immediately, but even before they re-enter, right? I think that's one of the things we need to um be sure that people understand is that reentry doesn't start the day the that's person right. is released. That that's really it's a really a process, and it needs to start while people are still in prison or jail. And and um, I don't know what the recommended time frame is. It's probably it's probably individualized, mm -hmm. but that we do need to be as we create these systems, they have to interact with the prisons and the jails and and start the work before so, they're released. So. Um, Actually, I, I am in the Philadelphia prison system uh, every Monday and Friday with an organization called Resources for Human Development. And I'm part of their Healing Ajax program, where we go in and we use the TREM model, which is Trauma Recovery Empowerment Model. So they're already active in addressing their trauma before they even get back on the street. So I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that. I mean, we are doing that in Philadelphia, and I would love to see that spread uh, all across the nation. I mean, it's important for them to get engaged in treatment before they even get out and start working on it. Because if they do get out and they, they haven't addressed it, you know, uh, bad things do happen. They go back to their old ways. But George, let me ask this. How realistic is it that every single facility is going to have a system where the inmates are assessed? Is that something that we need to work towards? Yes, it is. You know, in, in Illinois, we are in a couple of institutions right now. We have a program in, a, in Sheridan and one in Swick where we go in and we do a, 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 what's called an inner circle, where we circle up folks and have them to look at their behavior, thoughts, and, and activities that led them in that pathway. But every system needs to work on having some type of in-reach process where we go in and touch and have some basic level of of an assessment to begin to identify what are some of the presenting issues that he or she needs to work on. And we're trying to do that here uh, back in Illinois to make sure that we have some kind of way that everyone get touched at the point of entry, that there's an assessment done, there's a, there's a plan mapped out so that that can get followed up. Now, everyone may not get the individual treatment services, but they can begin to begin to reflect on some of the things that they need to address while they're in the process of serving their particular sentence. And the prison experience in and of itself is traumatizing. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That creates a traumatic kind of experience as well. To be separated from one's family and isolated in a, in a, in a setting of that type, I would think that that in and of itself is, is somewhat traumatic to some extent. And so we try to work on those kinds of issues as well. I call it a, a, a process of debriefing and rebriefing. How do we help them to debrief from thinking, acting, and behaviors, and then rebrief them as they think about returning to, every, to, to their respective communities as well? And Roberta, from, from, a, from a national perspective, yes. we've just heard the, the example of Illinois. Right. How are we doing as a nation, and what other states are doing uh, uh, or are, are actually engaged in, in the type of reforms that we, that we need to see? Absolutely. There's work being done on every level of government. Um, many sheriffs across this country have been charged with the task of needing to figure out how they can best serve their jail population, many of whom have 
have mental health disorders that have gone gone undiagnosed and untreated. And, and sadly, many of these law enforcement officials um, recognize the struggle that they have and they're actually seeking out support from the health care community to bring in appropriate assessment tools and even um, innovatively looking at private philanthropic organizations to help support their ability to get the kind of technical support that they need to set up a system that can serve this high need population. On the state level, it's also an issue where there's a, a great movement to reduce the prison populations. So many corrections officials are really working on looking at not only ways that they can reduce that population, but how can they make sure people have the support that they need in the community that they're returning to. And of course, on the federal level, same thing um, has been happening. Very good. And Timothy, from a perspective of the vets, are there advocates that are looking out for vets that are within the system to be able to provide the special services? Absolutely. Like I mentioned earlier, the Resources for Human Development's Healing Ajax program um, really does an incredible job of going behind the walls and helping these veterans, you know, to prepare them for release, uh, not only in there, but they link them up to services once they get out as well. So they're accustomed to the group, and it's, uh, it's really something special. Well, when we come back, I want to get back to see what else they're doing. It, you know, they're working directly with the vets and the institutions, but externally, how are we working to really move this issue forward? We'll be right back. I initially got into recovery through um, the help of peers. Um, you know, I really didn't know anything about recovery. And when I had started to engage with people who were living in recovery um, is when I actually saw my own two eyes that it was possible. And, you know, I, I actually ended up going to a, a veterans facility and there was, you know, people who were just like me living with the same, uh, you know, struggles. Recovery means to me um, an everyday process. Uh, when you're in recovery, you live it day in and day out. Without my recovery, I'm not there for my wife. I'm not there for my children. I'm not there for anybody. I'm not um, the person that I should be if I'm not in recovery. Being able to give back, um, you know, my recovery to other people has been such a rewarding process. Every um, every day I wake up and I get to help others, and it's uh, it's it's one of the most important things in my life. It's it's absolutely. Um, a dream come true. People were there for me in the beginning and, and to be able to give that back is something special for sure. Well, it's very important to provide uh, mental health treatment and addictions treatment to individuals as they are re-entering the community uh, setting uh, from correctional institutions. Um, the, um, we know that the existence of untreated behavioral health conditions and uh, addictions uh, often lead to recurrence of the criminal activity that was involved and um, in two individuals not doing well. Uh, and so treatment early is very important. SAMHSA has a number of programs that look at um, individuals are re-entering uh, the community. We, we, it's part of our mission to do what we can, wherever we can, to uh, enhance the success of individuals as they're re-entering the community from correctional institutions. A detailed listing of that's available on our website, um, but there are a number of different programs that are oriented toward successful re-entry. And we, and we know that successful re-entry uh, a lot of times involves uh, treatment, obtaining treatment for addictions as well as uh, mental health conditions. My family and friends are always with me, no matter where I may be. Sharing stories from home helps me sustain my recovery from my mental and substance use disorder. Hey Hi, Join the voices for recovery. Our families, our stories, 
our recovery. For confidential information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral, for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Welcome back. So, George, um, as we're looking at the people that are coming back, um, particularly those with a mental and substance use disorder who are reentering communities, um, what are some examples of community-based efforts specifically that, they, that they're going to uh, need to engage to? Yes, well, uh, good question. Well, one of the things that we like to do is that we have this process that called doable recovery model that we like to also have a clinical assessment so that we can figure out and then map where is the exact service that prescriptive to that individual to receive. And a part of our case management model is that we manage and, and help coach the individual to where they need to go, but then also we are there also to make sure that he or she is getting the right dosage of services that they need. That in, 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 in other words, sometimes it's very difficult for one to acknowledge a mental health issue or need to some extent, and, and particularly on what cultural implications may, may be there as well, it makes it even more difficult sometimes. So we help coach them to think about it and then to engage them into an environment that is conducive for them to feel a, a level of uh, trust, that they can trust where we make the referral, that they can trust exposing that particular issue of themselves to, in community. Because remember, I mean, they have a different whole concept of, about their lifestyles and as they're thinking about making these changes and so forth. So we want to make sure that they get the right need, the right doses of services, that we get them to the right place and that and that we establish the right relationship. So the right units of services. The right that, units that of services. Need. And right. speaking of doses, though, let's talk about medication treatment. I knew I was going to talk I about knew, that. I knew, I was ready. <laughs> <laughs> so th that is one of the things that's really important. If people um, need medication, that they have access to that immediately, right? So, so um, ideally, people are started on medication while they're still behind the walls, and that is continued, um, and they are connected with a prescriber, um, and other, other supports, whether they're peer supports or counseling supports, um, immediately upon release so that they aren't having to wait. So you don't want people to come out of prison or jail and um, have been um, uh, stabilized on medications there and then have to go off their medications while they're on a waiting list mm -hmm. um, or trying to hook up with a prescriber. So that's one of the things I think, uh, whether it's a case manager yes. or a peer support worker, however the system functions, um, that you need to engage people in um, making sure that they have access to those medications. Have we moved far enough in terms of medication treatment within the criminal justice system or, or are, are there pockets where people need to still consider setting up programs? I think there are pockets where there's services available or medications available and um, there's lots of room for change. Would that be, would, would you say that? I, I totally yeah. agree. <laughs> Totally agree. Um, and, and when thinking about this is again going back to individual needs. And, and I just want to pivot for a quick second because as George talked about dosage, I actually thought about it in terms of service delivery. So you may have some people that have gone through incarceration and, and come out and have been connected to, you know, have a, a, a rich resource of network and support in their community and when we try to um, get people to connect to other services it's too much or too little and that could be detrimental to their reintegration process so not every program suits the person which is why again we need to make sure that assessing and understanding the person's whole their whole makeup is, is reviewed because that does affect the care that they reach out. Because some people get where they don't want to go to any programs because they feel that they've been programmed out. Yeah, Timothy, I see you nodding your head. One of the things that, that you know, I think is, is paramount in all this is peer support. Yeah. Um, you know, overdosing somebody with a lot of stuff yeah. can be detrimental to them. So peer support, you know, we're the ones that are out there every day with the people walking in the trenches. We are the people that who 
have been through these things, so we yes. know what works. Um, we know how to regulate certain things and, 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 and connect certain things, and really everybody's recovery is different. Right. My recovery is, is different from the next person, so on and so forth. So it's all about coming up with what works for that individual, and that's where peer support comes in. Talk Absolutely. to us about your recovery a little yeah. bit. So my recovery, um, when I got back from Iraq um, after the invasion in 2003, I, um, you know, within four days I was arrested for aggravated assault, and I was sitting in a jail cell. I was using drugs and alcohol um, to deal with what I now know as PTSD. And being that I was one of the first to go to Iraq, when I came back, um, there weren't the services that there are today. So. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until um, after a very, very long road, seven arrests and almost a year of my life in prison, um, that I found peer support. And something about peer support that, for a military person, it brings the camaraderie back in their lives. Finally, they have a new mission, and that mission is recovery. So. And was it peer support with vets themselves uh, that, that were trained to be peer support specialists? Uh, it was. Um, it was a mixture of both, I would say. Um, mm. But, you know, I was finally put in the Philadelphia Veterans Court. And when I looked to my left and my right, I was surrounded by the people who were going through the same things that I was going through. Mm -hmm. And also the mentor aspect of it. Yes. Um, from veterans and people that have been through things, you know. Um, I work a lot with an organization called Justice for Vets. And, you know, they travel across the nation mm -hmm. um, training mentors, and these mentors are paramount to recovery. You know, it, you don't have to actually have been through some things um, to be a mentor. Um, you can be trained, and Justice for Vets will do that. So they're a big part of recovery. We have a self-help group that's called Winter Circles, and it's led by men and women that also have had the similar experience that, that coaches and, and support at a peer level, our, our constituents coming out of the system so that they too can relate to that experience. But you're right, they don't necessarily have to have the same experience, but have a commitment mm. to helping these individuals restore their lives. I love to call it helping them to, to restore their citizenship, their self-citizenship, their citizenship within their families and within their respective communities, how to take their rightful places and build that level of relationship and trust I think it's absolutely paramount to having that experience, that they have to have the right relationship and have to trust that that person have their interest, their self-interest at heart and as they help them to think through mm -hmm. and help them to begin to change their thinking that leads to changing their behavior. Absolutely. I commend you for that work out there. I also think we don't um, access family ties adequately. Some people have really mm -hmm. strong family support. I mean, others don't, but many people do, and I think that's a huge part of pe some people's recovery, and we, we need to assess that, yes. and we need to engage it um, in a supportive way. And, and I think that, that in, in many reentry programs, we don't do that enough. Yes. Right. Let's speak about now rural communities. I suspect that most of these services are more available within urban settings than yes. rural communities. Yes. So George, have you had experience with rural communities and, and, and you know, what are the challenges there and how are we addressing them? Absolutely. TAS is a statewide organization and so we work in all the counties, 102 counties within the state of Illinois, and we find that in our rural counties that the problem is distance between services. Sometimes services don't exist for 10, 15, 20, 30 miles where they can go in and get a particular service. And so one of the things that we're beginning to, 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 to implement is using media, uh, phones and, and tablets and so forth, and having, having check-ins and to, to, to find ways that we can have conversations to help that person, you know, uh, deal with their presenting issues to some extent until he and she can make that journey to get to where they need to get. And it also kind of relates to healthcare as well. You know, one of the things that we do is that we are enrolling all of our clients into healthcare, into health coverage, to make sure that they have some type of substantive uh, uh, medical health, health plan so that they can access services. And some of the, some of the physicians and, and some of the facilities are also using telemed, telehealth, and using 
media and ways of communicating until we can have that one-on-one -on -one kind of contact. Very and so good. we find it to be extremely useful in, out in our rural areas as well. And for, for women, um, Kim, let's start with you. I know you've, you've run uh, programs for women. And, and are there gender differences? And if so, how do we, how do we approach that, that challenge? I think the biggest gender difference when you're talking about offender reentry kinds of things is that women are primary child care um, they are the prim ones primarily responsible for child care, and so they have children who um, are with other people, whether they're involved with the child welfare system or family um, caregivers, and that whole process of re-engaging with their children, um, re re you know, who may have grown up quite a bit while in their absence, and they may have seen them very little. So I think that that is one of the major differences that you have to consider when you're thinking about um, women and reentry. Very good. We'll be right back. TASC stands for Treatment Alternatives for Safe Communities. We, TASC, have been around for 40 plus years. Uh, working at the intersection of the criminal justice system and substance use treatment. Our focus for all of that time has been on advocating for alternatives to incarceration. The whole thought process behind what we do has to do with uh, not only educating the system about addiction, but also the clients about what their journey is going to be like. We know from years and years of trying to lock people away and, and solve the problem that that doesn't work. Uh, so there has to be a different approach to uh, someone who has a substance use disorder. Law enforcement and prosecution are emerging as really significant um, diversion points in the justice system that will ultimately shrink the number of people going into uh, jails, prisons, etc. Task's role is to um, ensure that people get access to care in the community rather than in the criminal justice system. We've gotten a lot of positive response from uh, all sides of the bench with regard to diversion programs and having a system and a structure by which to triage and understand who these people are and divert them to the appropriate program and services. Here in Illinois, TASC partners with over 250 licensed substance abuse and mental health treatment programs. We work with four to 500 recovery support organizations, and they are critical to sustaining recovery for the folks that we're um, working with. It's very important uh, for someone just to reach out and hold your hand and tell you, hey, you're gonna make it through this, you're gonna be all right. We have basically, I would say, four major um, service delivery kind of units. Um, one is the alternatives to incarceration where we're advocates in court for people to get care in the community as opposed to going to, pr going to prison or jail. We have uh, our re-entry work that we do with the Department of Corrections and that's for people who participate in substance abuse treatment in the institution. We have um, our child welfare programs uh, where we are working with families who've lost custody of their kids because of a substance use disorder. We also um, work in the juvenile justice system and uh, do work with adolescents with substance use and mental health disorders. And where we had 1,800 um, youth in um, state corrections for juveniles, we're now down to around 400. It takes many hands to build a healthy life. Recovery from mental and substance use disorders is possible with the support of my community. Join the voices for recovery. Visible. Vocal. Valuable. For confidential information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. 
Welcome back. So, Roberta, you wanted to add something to the last uh, question that I had Absolutely, on women. Absolutely, yes. Um, first, I, I, I want us to think about the fact that the criminal justice system wasn't developed with the idea of putting women in in these systems and and sadly um, many of the the correctional institutions they haven't been set up to serve the needs of women so that's one and then two because of the the huge responsibilities that many women had before going in the trauma that they experienced before going in everything is magnified in a way um, that men may not experience. And the other thing that I notice is that many women have burned bridges with their families depending on what that journey has been that they've traveled, especially if they have had to battle with substance use disorders and mental health disorders. So their visits are a little different, their ties to their families are different, and a lot of the expectations are different in terms of what Kim talked about. They're expected to get their children back as soon as they get back, you know, and, and, and those expectations are, are so grand that it affects everything um, in that whole reintegration process. Because oftentimes they do need a, trans a transition within the transition with their children yes. exclusively. And, and some of them may need even to be taught how to be a, a, a good mother. Yes. And, the, and the whole family reunification, particularly if the kids have only seen their moms, I mean, sometimes they haven't seen them, right? It's right. too far away. And then sometimes they've seen them on visits maybe once a week or something. And so it's not thinking about how you re-engage. So even if you had the skills to start with, your child's in a very different place from when you left. And so it's very hard to, to do that whole re-engagement process and take on that responsibility while you're also struggling with all these other issues right. that we're talking about. And speaking of struggling, uh, Timothy, let's really take a look at the housing uh, needs of individuals that are coming back. How challenging is it for, for vets and for others, but for vets in particular? Oh, it's extremely uh, hard to get a veteran into housing. Um, you know, as we all know, it's, you know, there's a, a ton of people out there who need housing. And um, it's, it's quite a challenge because a lot of times the beds are full. Um, you know, there's a constant uh, rotation of people coming in and out of these programs. And, you know, that's where you lose people. You lose them back to the streets. When they don't have a roof over their head and they don't have a bed to sleep in at night, that's when things go wrong. So it is absolutely important to in my opinion, open more programs, build more housing programs, and get these people stable in a clean, healthy, happy environment. You have to take a holistic approach, and I think it starts with housing. And we know, um, Kim, that there are alternatives in Georgia, that there are alternatives in terms of housing <clears throat> settings, such as the Oxford House and other um, transitional housing for individuals that have a, a substance use disorder. How, um, are they connected to the the programs, you know, such as TASC, and, and yeah. are there an option, uh, or, or, you know, do, do family members step in, and oftentimes family members may not want this person yes. to come back to, yes. their, to their nucleus of the family? Yes. yes, as a matter of fact, that, that happens quite often where the family member, the person can't return to their family kind of uh, environment to some extent. One of the things I, I think is extremely critical is having an honest conversation about the housing that we know that there's extreme long waiting lists to get folks into alternative housing, halfway houses, three-quarter housing, Oxford houses, and so forth. But I think that if, if the individual have to return to their, with their family, there have to be a serious conversation with the family to go in there, to take a, have a conversation to see what are some of the needs of the family members, but to also have a, have a conversation that talks about the fact that George, this is George, George needs some serious support, not to be enabled, not to be kind of, you know, uh, 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 minimized in terms of what are my responsibilities. And so in our clinical assessment process, we have a real serious conversation and do a real critical analysis of what those implications are, 
Can we meet with the family and have that conversation? And, but can we prep that person? That's where the doable reentry model and the doable recovery come in, that they have to be able to understand that they have to maintain their goal regardless of, regardless of the challenges. But I think a serious conversation about the family have to take place and we have to go in there and figure out what are some of the needs of the family. Because, you know, when you go away under those circumstances, mm -hmm. there's some issues there. Yvette, can I and, add? and so forth. Certainly, go ahead. Um, the, the other issue I think we need to think about and talk about, many of these individuals are low income families and really rely on supportive housing networks, subsidized housing, federally subsidized, state subsidized housing. And one of the greatest challenges faced by this population are criminal record restrictions um, that are imposed. Um, and, and we see that there are not many protections that people have and opportunities that people have to get housing um, for for public and federally subsidized housing or private housing often they have to answer um, questions about their history and be prepared to talk about it also pay for background checks um, that have to be done and so navigating those barriers and those challenges and the fact that there are very few I mean the, the, the need for low-income housing is so great across the country and the lack of affordable housing is one of the biggest challenges faced by people who, that have somewhat you know become, gotten stable in the community and simply need to have their own place in their own space but can't get it and and I'm glad that you mentioned affordable because that assumes George that they have jobs mm -hmm. no, and how yes. do we get them into jobs yes that <laughs> is some, a, some kind of income well, right? some kind of income right. some kind of legal income yes <laughs> you know one of the things that again I like to have is honest conversations that there is there's challenges in, in terms of jobs and that where can we get you in where you can fit in it may not be the job that you want, but it might be the job that you need right now. Mm -hmm. And so can we have that honest conversation and can you accept that reality? And sometimes there are some opportunities to get, to get someone into a uh, living uh, wage, uh, either having some type of income, but having a real serious, honest conversation about the challenges about that. Because there are serious challenges about work in this country as a whole. And as, we, and as we talk about someone with a criminal background, that creates other issues as well, particularly if it's criminal background as, as well as drugs or alcohol implications also. So we have an honest conversation and look for partners. And there are partners, there are some partners out there that can get people placed, I mean, very successfully. But the person has to be willing to get in where they can fit in right now as they work towards their higher goals in terms of employment. And Timothy, let's talk about some of the training programs that may be in place for vets in order for them to get the training to be able to, to then become more independent. Okay, so um, a lot of veterans do have the Montgomery GI Bill um, where they could utilize it to go to college. Um, there's also uh, vocational rehabilitation where they can go to trade schools and stuff like that and use that money barring that they're eligible. The problem is they're not always eligible for that. And what would keep them from being eligible? Um, a dishonorable discharge, even though they have served. We see a lot of veterans who have done multiple tours in Iraq or Afghanistan, and they may have committed a crime that's directly related to them living with mental health issues such as PTSD or traumatic brain injury. And then they lose their, their honorable discharge, and they're not eligible for these programs. And uh, quite frankly, it's a disgrace. Is there a reconsideration of people taking a look at uh, there is. that have, area? They have done a better job of, you know, kind of reevaluating, and you can you can apply for a discharge upgrade. Um, but I think the process. That's needs what I thought I read in the in the news recently. In my opinion, the process needs to to get better and needs to get faster because. Um, you know, with the opiate epidemic, we're losing people at a rapid rate, and a yes. lot of these people are, um, you know, being addicted to painkillers, you know, because of injuries that happen in combat. And um, a lot of work needs to be done. Very good. Um, very quickly, um, Kim, 
what programs does SAMHSA have in terms of re-entering uh, individuals that are coming back into the community? We have, um, the primary program that we have is we have a grant program, offender reentry program, um, that, that is, is money that goes to communities to help them uh, set up these systems of care to help people um, re-enter. So that's one thing. We also have a number of um, tools and, and information resources on our website, and people should just go to the website and, um, and, and um, do a search term on offender re-entry. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, when we come back, we will be talking a little more about the resources that are within the community to help individuals re-enter. We'll be right back. I'm a recovering heroin addict. Um, for 20 years, I was in my addiction. And I first came through tests, yes, through the criminal justice system, getting arrested, getting probation. I came into tests. I had a test recovery coach. Her name was Ada Villanueva. And she has been a huge part of my life, my success, my recovery. The majority of offenders who are released from prison go right back to the same communities that they lived in before they got in trouble. So we know that reentry is necessary for them to make a healthy transition. Uh, and also to kind of prepare that community for um, them to come home. I think it was critical to me to have um, the support network I had. I was a fish out of water. Here I am coming home from doing a 12-year sentence. Uh, here I am uh, basically on an island because I know nobody. And yet I had individuals from TASC who said, uh, here's our phone number, here's what we do, don't be a stranger. We're here to help you. Treatment centers, transitional centers, um, transitional shelters, recovery centers, all of that is, is huge for a person coming out of the criminal justice system. The biggest thing that stands out to me is that people didn't quit on me. Long after I quit on myself, I had individuals from TASC at my door saying, Okay, we understand where you've been, what's happened. Let's focus on what we need to do to move forward. And support like that definitely um, is a huge part of their recovery and their success. I don't even know if these programs didn't exist or wasn't available to me. Like, I, I wouldn't be standing where I'm at today. I wouldn't. Trauma is a pretty common experience for people who have been involved in the criminal justice system. If you think even just, just the act of getting arrested um, and, and how tra traumatic that can be for many people, but then the whole experience of being in jail or prison and the kind of environment that that um, creates, and depending on the length of time that someone has been there, um, you know, re-entry can be a traumatic experience in and of itself. The world has changed. We've really started to look at re-entry as a process. And it used to be that, that that process started when you were released, right? You got released and then you did, you did the re-entry stuff. And what we know now is you can't start that process the day of release. It has to start behind the walls um, and be a process. So, so we're talking about things now like starting people on medication while they're still behind the walls. And then um, in connecting them with whether it's case management or whether it's um, therapists or you know, whatever the services that they need. One of SAMHSA's strategic initiatives for the past six years has been um, trauma and justice. So we have, out of that initiative, we've created a lot of activity around um, both those two issues, trauma and justice. A couple that CSAT specifically have been involved with is we have the GAIN Center, which is a technical assistance center with a lot of information, a lot of tools and support for providers around working with the criminal justice system. And of course we have TIP 57, 
I know many people have the whole set of 60 tips. Tip 57 is about trauma-informed care, um, which includes information about um, trauma and the criminal justice system specifically. For more information on National Recovery Month, to find out how to get involved or to locate an event near you, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. Welcome back. Uh, Timothy, I'm going to start with you. Um, tell us if, if there are vets that are watching and, and, and they, they have had uh, um, contact with the criminal justice system and, and really are looking to, to get some help, where would they go? I think one of the most important things that we're doing in Pennsylvania is uh, the Pathways to Pardons um, movement where they can apply for a pardon and they've, they're doing a really good job in the state of Pennsylvania as far as uh, speeding that process up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that ugly word that's always attached, stigma, you know what I mean, that, that we have to get rid of um, is always there in the Pathways to Pardons program. Um, I was actually in an event recently with uh, Lieutenant Governor Stack from Pennsylvania and he's out there every day, he's leading the way, he's, um, you know, he really wants people to have a second chance and, um, you know, I think more people need to um, do the same thing. But uh, nationally, they can also find resources? Absolutely, yes. Okay, fine. Uh, George, in terms of the programs that you may have, are there others modeling some of the efforts? I know that TASC is a leader in the criminal justice area. And, and what have you found on a national scale that that really responds well to, to these needs. Uh, thank you. You know, when, when we did the Second Chance Act, one of the, one of the uh, entities that was created, the Council of State Government, have a listing of most all of the reentry criminal justice type services around the country. And so I think that is a good national resource. TAS has a number of national TAS-like programs of, around the country. That, that operate in various states that have similar kinds of services, such as the service that we have, case management as one of the core components, some of the modeling of, of clinical case, uh, uh, case management, as well as doable recovery services and so forth. So I think that if, if the individual, family and friends, and will do a, a search they can find within their respective communities services that stir. There's quite a few services out there. Now, how one pick and choose the right service, that's where we come in to help them to navigate, to help educate them, help them to navigate, and then help them to understand how they need to, to negotiate services as they think about making changes in their lives to take their rightful places in, in their respective communities. So, so there's a wealth of services. It's just a matter of being able to locate them and pinpoint them. But if there's communities out there that are really um, on the brink of thinking of, of establishing a program for reentry in their community, what model would you say is the first one that they need to take a look at and the first one that they need to adopt? I would recommend clinical case management that they need a case management model and then a peer-based service as well. Clinical case management, that's like coaching, that's like reentry coaching services that have a specific set of, of principles that one would have to incorporate to make sure that the basic needs foundationally are, are, are being provided and then having someone that they can coach them through the process, through their peer-led kinds of uh, services as well. And, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of models of services out there that kind of have that baseline. Clinical case management to help someone through the process. Very good. Roberta, talk to us about the HIRE program. Absolutely. So we created the HIRE network because at the time in and early 2000s. tell me 2000s, again what that stands for. Helping individuals with criminal records re-enter through employment. And what we had found was employment was the primary need that people came to us looking, looking for help to get. 
And we realized um, in late 1990s, early 2000s, that people didn't really know how to find resources within their community. They didn't know what agencies to look to for support, employment support, or the community-based programs that they could reach out to. So we set out to create this national network and a web portal that has a resources and assistance page that documents all of the relevant state agencies a person might need to connect to, such as the Department of Labor, their local Department of Labor that documents how to get to the workforce agencies, the one-stop centers in their community, the state repository, the state agency that maintains criminal records, how they get their rap sheet, review those records in preparation for employment, and then a whole listing of service providers in their community that provides employment support. And so we really set out, and, and this is something that we maintain to this day, um, we've had over 15 million visitors to our site and, and people that are in the federal prisons has looked to this as a resource because we've documented for all 50 states and the District of Columbia various support organizations within those communities that could provide employment support training, um, um, coaching, job placement, all of it. Um, that we document and update year to year. And so it's important that people have some place that they, they can at least start. And, and, and I have to say, with employment, people typically will need to rely on an intermediary for support because there's so much, when talking about the trauma that we've talked about here, there's much trauma before and during incarceration. People have a lot that they have to work through to become job ready. And so we need to make sure that people are ready to be employed so that they can stay employed and they need to receive support services in order to do that. Very good. Thank you. Well, we've come to the point where I'm going to let everyone give me their final thoughts. And I hope somebody speaks to, I know you mentioned stigma. We're trying to change that around and call it discriminatory behaviors and discriminatory um, attitudes towards those in recovery or in need of recovery. And I hope one of you mentions this during your, your last wrap up. So I'm going to start with okay, Kim well, and you've got some, <laughs> I'll, I'll start with you for last thoughts. I, I, so I, we, we have been trying to use language around discrimination as opposed to stigma because um, stigma is really about the individual, right? It's how, how I'm perceived. Um, and, and really what we want to focus on is how people treat that, the individual who's in recovery, right? So, so we have been talking um, more about um, the more active verb, <laughs> discrimination or to discriminate. Um, my, my, the last thing I actually want to throw in here is we've been talking about the Second Chance Act and about reentry, but when we think about criminal justice reform, there's a whole continuum, right, from community policing and engaging young people in pro-social behavior all the way through drug courts, um, and, and reentry is kind of the last phase of that. And so we just really need to think about this in the context of that whole continuum. Very good, George. Thank you. Uh, we are working on, uh, from the very front end, a, a model called no entry to where we're doing in services and re-entry. And how can we help impact public opinion about the plight and the challenges men and women coming out of the criminal justice system faces and to ask them to give them a chance. And as the individual take an honest assessment of his or her needs and make that personal commitment to change in their lives, I want everyone to know, individually, family, as well as community, there's help available. If you seek it and ask it and look for it in the way that you know that you need to make those changes and that stigma can paralyze you sometimes, but you have to be honest about the things you need to do to make some changes in your life. And we're pushing the public to change their opinion, how we are they're responding to individuals coming out the system. Very good, and you used that word again, stigma. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Roberta. Yes, one way I know that we will be able to address stigma and, and address the perception that people have of people with substance use histories and, and mental health disorders and histories is I'm going to take a phrase from a, co a former colleague of mine at Just Leadership USA. 
people closest to the problem are closest to the solution. So any change that we make in our society, in our communities, are going to have to be led by people who have walked the walk and have come through on the other side because it's their lives that that reflects where we want to go. And, and it takes that to, to really have an impact and change on communities across this country. Very good, Roberto. Timothy. So it, it comes down to uh, education, I believe. Educating the community, educating families, like George had mentioned earlier. Um, educating everybody. I think we can reach people and, and, and turn that discrimination around. Um, it's not going to happen overnight. It takes everybody to do it together, and it's um, it's a work in progress. We're getting there. Um, one thing that I always like to say is, especially through peer support, is the uh, you know a lot of people a lot of people out there don't have any hope, so sometimes they need to borrow some hope, mm -hmm. and you know that's what we need people in the community to do to be hope lenders, to get these people back on their feet and show them that uh, you know recovery is possible and everything's going to be all right. Together we can do that for sure. And I think also in your case that vets really do need a, an extra helping hand because their problems are a lot more complex than, than, than the ones of, of perhaps other sectors in society. Sure. It's, um, you know, it's, we just ran the two uh, longest wars in U.S. history side by side. And less than 1% of the United States uh, people actually serve in the military today. So that's something to think about. It's, um, it's a challenge for sure. Well, thank you. I want to thank the panel today. And I want to remind our audience that September is National Recovery Month. And we encourage you to go to recoverymonth.gov to look at all the resources that you can find to create events, bring your family to events and, and participate in this very important observance. Uh, it is something that can help you not only deal with the issues that we have talked about here today, but really let the broader community know about what the needs are. We wanna thank you for being here. It's been a great show. Thank you. To watch this program or other programs in the Road to Recovery series, visit the website at recoverymonth.gov. For those with a mental or substance use disorder, recovery starts when you ask for help. Join the Voices for Recovery. Speak up. Reach out. For information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Every September, National Recovery Month provides an opportunity for communities like yours to raise awareness of mental and substance use disorders, to highlight the effectiveness of prevention, treatment, and recovery services, and show that people can and do recover. In order to help you plan events and activities in commemoration of this year's Recovery Month observance, the free online Recovery Month kit offers ideas, materials, and tools for planning, organizing, and realizing an event or outreach campaign that matches your goals and resources. To obtain an electronic copy of this year's Recovery Month kit and access other free publications and materials on prevention, recovery, and treatment services, Visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov or call 1-800-662-HELP.